with me a little bit. I can't get the application sharing to work the way it normally does. So hopefully this will work. Um, so chapter 10 talks about conflict theory. Um, and the basic idea behind conflict theory is that it's the opposite of a consensus model of law. So a consensus model says the reason that things, certain behaviors are illegal is because society has come to a consensus that this is bad behavior and it should be punished. Conflict theory says we don't really have consensus on our major values. And that what becomes sort of the main determinant of what happens with the law is how much power someone has. So the people with the most power are able to control the law. Therefore, their values are adopted as legal standards for behavior. People who are less powerful continue to act according to their own values and norms. And this, these values or norms may be in conflict with those of the powerful, and that may result in their behavior being law-violating behavior. So what the conflict theory does is um, it explains criminal and deviant behavior, but it also helps explain the law. So recall that law is a type of social control. Okay, we have informal and formal social control. Social control is essentially a system of norms for behavior um, and a system of formal and informal mechanisms to control when people break the rules. So most social control that we experience on a regular basis is informal, right? So we're looking at reactions to family, friends, people in our neighborhood, uh, people in groups that are important to us. Formal social control refers to the law and the criminal justice system. So those are officially um, promulgated rules and they're, author, uh, they're enforced by a legally authorized individual. These types of social control are inversely related. So as one increases, the other decreases. If there is a breakdown in informal social control, this leads to a need for more formal social control. Um, social control relies on the socialization of members of the community. Socialization refers to the process of teaching someone the values of the community uh, and that person learning those values, norms, and customs. We learn those through the examples that others set for us, as well as through um, punishments and rewards we see for our behavior. If the law contains the same norms and values that we've learned, then we can form our behavior to the law. So most people, most of the time, conform. No informal system can rely completely on internal control. We need external sanctions to socialize children. And this does continue throughout adulthood. Um, so this could include the giving and withholding of affection, praise, ridicule, acceptance, or rejection. The law differs from other types of social control. It basically relies on formal negative sanctions or punishments. And these punishments have been authorized and legitimized by the state. So law then refers to a system of rules that have been promulgated and enforced um, by the state that exercises authority over a territory and recognizes no higher secular authority. Secular meaning non-religious. So as you guys learned in intro CJ and you've learned in some other classes, Basically, two perspectives exist on the development of law, two major perspectives. One is this consensus model, one is the conflict model. So the consensus model develops out of this idea that there is widespread consensus in society. And the conflict model says the law is a product of conflict between group interests and the exercise of power. So the law protects the interests of those with economic, social, and political power. So let's think about consensus and functionalist theories of law. Until the 60s, um, the major sociological approach to law and social control was based on consensus theory. Uh, Durkheim, we have probably talked about him a couple times, argued that law evolves from the type of solidarity that characterizes that society. If it's a mechanical solidarity. This exists in less complex societies, and members here are integrated by common values and beliefs. 
here the law is oppressive and punitive. Organic solidarity exists in complex, diverse societies that are integrated by interdependence, okay? So this is like our society, right? The main way we punish people, the main penalty is uh, deprivation of your freedom, and we do that by incarceration. Um, Weber, he's a, um, who writes a lot about the economy, proposed that as economically advanced societies become more rational, the law becomes more rational, and people start to adhere to the rule of law. So formal rationality uh, refers to due process and fair procedures. Um, so when we think about all the civil liberties and protections that somebody has if they've been accused of a crime, that would refer to, that's what due process is. Right, so we have substantive law that tells us what we can and can't do and what the penalty is. Due process law uh, has to do with what are the rules of the game. So substantive rationality is not the fairness of the outcome um, according to ideology. So the classic statement of consensus theory has been developed by Sumner. And this basically says that law is developed through codification. Okay, so codification is when uh, originally, law is passed down orally, actually written and codified, uh, legislation and court rulings, okay? And these initially reflect prevailing mores. Uh, if you guys recall from deviance and social control, a more is a type of norm, but it has significant moral uh, implications. And folk ways, which are sort of routines uh, for our behavior. Uh, they're unorganized intuitive principles of right and wrong, and they've evolved over a long period of time. Um, they are mutable, okay, but it's very, they're very slow to change. Um, if you think about, for those of you that might be taking cybercrime, if you think about how fast technology has developed and how slow the law is to catch up with that. Um, when laws are passed, they try to express those underlying mores. Um, Sumner's main emphasis here is that how the law is shaped, uh, focuses on how the law is shaped by society's custom. This is the dominant model throughout the early part of the 20th century. The functionalist perspective underscores consensual norms and values of society, um, how social systems create an orderly state of equilibrium, and the law's ultimate function of social integration. So this overlaps with the variant of consensus theory. The functionalist theory sees the law as functioning for the greater public welfare, right? So the law exists to provide um, public welfare. Uh, it serves the interests of everyone, and it can also be symbolic. Um, so whether or not laws necessarily deter specific behavior, sometimes they have great symbolic function. So we've talked um, in some prior classes, and we've certainly talked about this in ethics, about laws that we know do not work and that are still in place. Uh, so if you think about something like sex offender notification, perhaps this is a law that serves less of a deterrent function and more of a symbolic function. Neither of these models has many proponents today. Um, so let's think about the conflict theory. Conflict theory begins to challenge consensus theory in the 50s. Um, some of the people who have looked at this are Quinney, Chambliss, and Turk. Um, so Quinney has an article in the Deviance and Social Control book, for those of you that have already taken that class. Uh, Shambliss writes about the things in Roughnecks. Um, so they basically argue that criminology has focused on explaining criminal behavior, and one thing that needed to be explained was the law, okay? So why are certain laws developed? How does the law develop? Why does it develop that way? Turk said there was a need to explain criminality, uh, the process by which certain behavior and individuals are designated as criminal. Okay, so not criminal behavior, um, but what is that process of, uh, it's pretty similar to what, you know, Quinney and Shambliss are talking about here. Shambliss says, how come some acts are defined as criminal while others are not? So conflict theory has an answer to this. The conflict theory argues that um, how the law is formulated, how the law is enforced, is directly and indirectly related to serving the interests of the most powerful groups in society. Early consensus theory did acknowledge that the law often favors special groups, um, but this is really, so while consensus theory acknowledges this, conflict theory, this is really a central tenet. 
um, dominant groups are allowed, who are the groups that have the most power, are able to ensure that their particular particular definitions of normal norm, normality and deviance become law, become ensconced in public policy, and are protected by the criminal justice system. So when people who are less powerful, when their behavior violates the law, they're less able to resist the criminal justice system intervening. So a lot of times factors like class, race, sex, age, and ethnicity play a big role in who is apprehended and who is punished. The theory did leave room for consensus. For most crimes, if you think about violent crimes, crimes against people, there's generally consensus against it. So if we think about um, murder, rape, robbery, um, there is general cons uh, assault and battery. These are general consensus that these are not okay behaviors. Uh, it's also true that sometimes laws that are not in the best interest of those in power are also passed. So the law is both a result of and a weapon to be used in group conflict. If you think about it, some groups have considerable power, but no group is all powerful. Quinney rejected the idea of pluralism and says that it views the political state as nothing more than a fair, neutral arena for competing ideas. Um, this is a share. This is a view that is expressed by critical theorists and Marxist theorists. McGarrell and Castellano look at an integrative conflict model, and they said there are three factors that come into play in terms of how the law is made and how policies are made. Um, at the highest level, there are fundamental social structural conflicts. These are conflicts that are generated by the fact that we have a diverse society and we have an unequal society. Uh, here we see symbolic conflicts in terms of how people perceive crime and myths about crime. Uh, in the middle level, we have rates of victimization, fear of crime, and public demands for the punishment of criminals. Uh, at the lowest level, we have more immediate events that often trigger change, how the media reports on a crime, um, how interest groups, uh, what activities they're engaging in, um, and political events. The development of this pluralistic conflict model continues to reject an idea that there is a system that is tightly controlled by a small, powerful elite. Uh, what they say instead is that there is a decentralized, loosely coupled system that has multiple groups of power. Um, and these people do not always agree. They may have competing interests as well. They have the ability to interject their influence, and they do respond to institutional, economic, and political changes. This pluralistic conflict model is applicable to democratic societies, where we have a lot of competing interest groups. These interest groups want to uphold their own values um, through what the legislature and the government. If you think about some of the things that have sort of been uh, front and center um, in our society and our culture recently, if you think about um, different groups and how they've tried to define a woman's right to control her body. Okay, so we've got competing interest groups. Um, we've got groups that say we should limit abortion. Abortion should not exist and other groups that say women have a right to choose. Um, there is an underlying agreement among groups on the legitimacy of the political system. For instance, no group is going to use its power to overthrow the current government. What is likely to happen in this model, though, is the groups that have the most power, the most resources, are the best organized, and have the most people, are likely to be the winners. Groups also seek the protection of their values through legislation. They try to influence um, appointments that are made by the president or various governors, including um, judges. So, you know, which judges get appointed. Uh, many groups have threatened um, or defended by criminal law are symbolic. Um, so, we think about um, types of laws on which there is not a great deal of consensus: prostitution, drugs, gambling. These are laws that are really symbolic in nature, right? They're really sort of sending a message about um, moral behavior, even though they are often not effective in controlling that particular behavior. We know that the war on drugs has been a miserable failure, um, 
but people don't want to come out and say, hey, we should make drugs widely available to people. The core, again, of criminal law really reflects consensus. We shouldn't engage in violence against people. We shouldn't destroy property. Um, and sometimes we see this reflected in another way of thinking about or organizing the law. Crimes that are mala in se versus mala prohibita. Uh, so mala in se crimes, right, are crimes that are considered evil in and of themselves. Uh, but there's not always complete agreement here either. So what constitutes murder? Uh, we've talked before about the felony murder rule. Um, if um, we all decide to rob a bank together and one of you decides to bring a gun, uh, and you shoot and kill somebody, we are all equally responsible for that, that murder, right? Um, should that be the case? Uh, what about rules that determine when we should actually apply the death penalty? So even some of the core criminal law may not have originally had consensus. Uh, embezzlement wasn't always a crime. Initially, it was a personal injury. Um, as we saw this merchant class develop, they wanted to see embezzlement treated as a crime. So embezzlement is when someone who is entrusted with property then converts that property for their own personal use. Um, theft was a law that re required a trespass onto land, and so originally this was a law that protected people who owned land. Powerful groups frequently try to shape public sentiments to take, um, you know, uh, public sentiments to that new law takes on the appearance of consensus. Um, news plays a major role here. Um, social threats also play a role in how the law is formed. Uh, the greater number of acts and people threatening the interests of the power, well, the greater the level of deviance and crime control. So if you remember, this uh, criminal justice system has quite a bit of discretion uh, at each stage of the system. So what kind of empirical and research support is there for consensus and conflict theory? There's been four types of empirical studies, okay? Some look at the influence of interest groups, okay? Interest groups are groups that are developed around a particular special interest um, and how they have lobbied for that. So think about something like Mothers Against Drunk Driving. There's been research on consensus or dissensus in public opinion. Um, some research has looked at relationships between the presence of threatening social groups and how that impacts crime control within the same area. Um, and then the most common type of research has looked at how discretion is used in applying the law. Uh, and that might be looked at in terms of juvenile or adult offenders. So let's start with the first category, research on legislation and public opinion on crime and criminal justice. So these are studies of how interest groups impact something. Um, this might include research on early historical periods and might include more recent events. And we can look and see how these special interest groups might be able to impact the law. So these may have looked at um, or investigated the background and nature of group conflict in terms of how laws on theft, vagrancy, prostitution, smoking, et cetera, have developed. Um, these have often identified um, specific groups that are involved in influencing public policy. Uh, so these could be religious groups, business groups, um, and even law enforcement can act as special interest groups. There's an organization called LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. These are people who have worked or currently work in law enforcement um, and do not believe in drug prohibition. Um, the preponderance of the evidence, so more evidence than not, right, so that's kind of like a tipping point, just more than 50% of the evidence finds little support for either pure consensus or pure conflict, right? And that is um, consistent with what a pluralistic conflict model looks like, right? So we don't have a purely consensus model. We don't have a purely um, conflict model. What about research that looks at consensus or dissensus in public opinion? Um, so, some have looked at consensus on the core criminal law, um, and we do find that there is consensus on this, and that cuts across other variables that often impact, um, you know, uh, different correlates of crime. Um, the more serious the offense, the more serious offenses are the most heinous, the most threatening to society. 
Um, public morality, consensual acts of private, ranked the lowest, and there's a lot more disagreement here. Um, the consensus on the core criminal law is very real, okay? But it still doesn't support a pure consensus model. So again, this supports a pluralistic conflict theory. There's also been research on what's called social threat uh, and extra legal variables. So there are legal variables in determining what type of punishment somebody should receive or um, you know, how we want to take somebody through the criminal justice system. Okay? Those would be things like the theory of the defense, someone's prior record. There's also extra legal variables. These are variables that should not be taken into account. Someone's race, ethnicity, their uh, sex. So some of this research has looked at what are considered threatening social groups. Okay? Let's take the more macro level approach. It's looking more at a societal approach. And it's focused on uh, the composition of an area and measures of punitiveness. Here, there are mixed results, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that the research isn't very well done. Okay, So the methodology is not very good and has quite a few shortcomings. Um, so this finds weak to moderate support for a correlation between the percentage of black or poor and things such as the size of a police department, the funding, and the use of excessive force. So most of these are using indirect tests of threat hypothesis. More specific measures of threat, we've got political threat, which is the ratio of black to white voters, or has been measured this way. Economic threats, which have been re measured as the ratio of black to white employment, and the threat of black crime, uh, black offender, white victim, uh, felony crime rate. Uh, black on white crime, but not black on black crime, tends to lead to more arrests of black offenders. Um, one thing we want to think about here is it's often not the race of the offender that's important, it's the race of the victim. Um, and so this may mean that police often favor white victims. Uh, these measures of social threat have also been looked at globally um, in a study of 140 nations, where they looked at things like religious, ethnic, and linguistic, so language diversity. Um, after controlling for economic stress, political stability, and violent crime, they found that the more diverse the population is, the higher the rate of imprisonment. Um, it also means the more diverse the population is, the less likely they are to abolish the death penalty. And if you think about it, the United States has a very diverse population. We have a very high rate of imprisonment. We have the highest rate in the world. Um, and we also are not very likely to abolish the death penalty. Other research here has looked at how discretion is used. Okay? So basically here the argument is that those with less power will be, we'll find the criminal justice system working against them. Uh, the criminal justice system upholds values and interests of the middle and upper class. So people who are less powerful are more likely to be arrested, prosecuted, convicted, and receive severe penalties. Um, the argument here is that this is based on extra legal variables, things like race, class, age, and gender. Uh, if we're arguing that extra legal variables play some role, that's very easy to support. There's quite a bit of research that shows this is true. If we're saying, though, that these decisions are made solely on the basis of extra legal variables, there's absolutely no support for this. Um, so just like when we talk about deterrence having to do with rational choices, and we have to stop and say, you know, we don't mean fully rational choices, we have to sort of take the same approach here, that it is not solely based on extra legal variables. Um, this, however, is a very testable part of the theory, uh, and the majority of evidence weighs against the hypothesis. Decisions are much more likely to be based on legal variables. We know that those are the factors that play the biggest, the, the, the largest role. So, one question to think about, do differences, do the differences correspond to the ones hypothesized in the theory? And some do. Um, the black, uh, black and poor folks are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Um, but other differences contradict the theory. Um, so less powerful people should be treated more harshly and be more stigmatized, yet men who have more power than women vastly outnumber female offenders. Uh, they're more likely to be arrested, convicted, and receive a long sentence. Another question to think about, to what extent are decisions based on social characteristics? 
Uh, to support the hypothesis, we would need an observed difference to be based primarily on extra legal factors. Um, again, here we know that, uh, and this is sort of the most standing evidence against the theory, is that while extra legal variables do play a role, overwhelmingly legal variables are the determinant of whether or not someone is arrested, um, whether or not they're given bail, whether or not they're convicted, and the type of sentence they receive. One conflict theorist took this evidence as far as saying that racism in the criminal justice system is a myth. Well, this overstates the case. There is certainly discrimination in some parts at some stages by some individuals. We want to remember that even a little bit of discrimination at each stage of the system adds up quickly to be a large amount of discrimination. So in Florida, for example, black youth are treated more harshly in the juvenile justice system for major offenses whereas white youth are treated more harshly for minor offenses. Uh, this isn't based on individual racism, but rather an institutionalized racism. The places where we're most likely to see these disparities are with discretionary decisions. Um, this is hard to research because this is a subtle complex phenomenon. Um, it's not that people are necessarily saying, oh, look at this defendant, he's black, um, we should remand him without bail. Uh, it's more that people are more likely to perceive certain groups of people as dangerous, and then dangerousness is used as a predictor for bail. When we look at death penalty research, we don't see, as I mentioned, significant differences based on the race of the offender. Uh, white murderers actually face double the risk of the death penalty. The issue here, though, has to do with the race of the victim. If you murder a white victim, you're more likely to be indicted and prosecuted for a capital offense, which carries the death penalty. And the combination most likely to result in the death penalty is a black offender with a white victim. So this is a good example of what we mean when we say that how race plays out in the criminal justice system is complex. Um, the strongest, again, the strongest predictors of the length of sentence for somebody are legal variables. Um, race of offender, race of victim, those combinations are significant variables in terms of murder and sex offenses. Um, so from 1929 to 1985, we saw a pattern in terms of the sentencing of female murders in Alabama. White female murderers were twice as likely to get white sentences. Uh, in terms of interracial homicide, 50% of blacks who murdered whites received life sentences. No whites who murdered blacks received a life sentence. Uh, this was most common in the pre-civil rights era. So both the decision to sentence someone to prison and the length of the sentence are related to legal variables. We do still see, though, a small to moderate effect of extra legal variables. Whites receive the most lenient sentences, while blacks and Hispanics receive harsher sentences. Uh, um, when we look at women, those effects of race and ethnicity disappear. These differences likely result from what judges focus on. They look at blameworthiness and dangerousness. Uh, and they might be concerned about how some offenders would handle serving a hard time. Um, so women tend to benefit from beliefs about them as less culpable, less dangerous, and less likely to recidivate. Um, we also want to remember that not all racial differences are racially motivated. So there are disparities, which means standards have been applied and they result in different results for different groups. Discrimination means we're making decisions based on race or ethnicity or class. The final question to think about is, how is it that a system found by careful research to be relatively even-handed in terms of arrest, prosecution, conviction, and sentencing, how does that result in a prison population that is so disproportionately black, poor, and male? So as I said before, research at any stage finds little difference by race, class, or gender. But as we move through the system, those disparities increase, and they start to have a cumulative effect. So that by the time someone makes it all the way to the end of the system, and if sentenced to incarceration, we see much larger differences. Um, habitual and career offender research may provide the answer to this. By age 18, 50% of black male youths will have had at least one police encounter. Uh, that's only 28% of white male youths. Um, Wolfgang, Marvin Wolfgang did this research where he discovered what's referred to as the chronic 6%. So there are 6% of the offending population is responsible for half of all police arrests. Um, so if we could target that group of people, we could really make a major impact um, in the crime rate. 
Um, most people with the juvenile arrest record do not continue offending into adulthood, but 80% of the chronic 6% did. Overrepresented here were black and lower class men. So what is more likely to be happening is that blacks and poor folks are overrepresented amongst chronic offenders. Chronic offenders are the ones most likely to receive time. Uh, they also tend to be subject to policies of what we call selective incapacitation. This is sort of the idea that I just mentioned, that if we could try to properly identify the people who are chronic offenders and most likely to be chronic offenders and incarcerate them for longer periods of time, we could drastically reduce the, um, the crime rate. Research here tends to focus almost exclusively on formal decision points. What we don't really do is look at so much what's happening in informal interactions. Um, it may be that race and class discrimination are found in the way police patrol neighborhoods, um, citizen harassment, uh, stop, search, stop, and interrogate, and of course, as we've seen uh, in the news over the last year or so, how excessive force is used. When we talk about racial profiling, it's important to remember that racial profiling refers to um, solely making a decision based on race. Race is allowed to be used as part of a larger profile, um, but we can't stop somebody based solely on their race. Uh, so, for example, this uh, the practice of DWB or driving while black is often um, discussed in terms of racial profiling. Much of the research on racial profiling has some methodological flaws. So, one thing they often do is they look at the percentage, they use census data to determine um, what's the race breakdown in a particular neighborhood, okay? Uh, the problem is, if we're talking about uh, stops, when we're driving, when people are driving and we're stopping them, um, we need to not look at what's the racial makeup of the community, but what's the racial makeup of the drivers where the driver stops. So if you think about what's the, uh, the racial makeup and the ethnic makeup of our program and our college, is that really reflective of the racial makeup of the people who live in Beacon Hill? Uh, one thing that's hard to do, too, is if we want to research this, how do we show that an officer's decision is based slow, solely on race? That's going to be pretty hard to show. All right, complex theory of criminal behavior. So complex theory explains crime and deviant behavior as an ordinary, learned, normal behavior of people who are caught up in cultural and group conflict. So crime essentially becomes an expression of that conflict. So it results when people act according to the norms of their group, which may actually violate the law. So this happens a lot of times when a group is newly immigrated to the United States. Um, they may be adhering to old customs, and these may be things that are against the law here in the United States. Other crimes do result from direct group conflict. So when people are uh, protesting, um, lynching, bombing churches, I should say lynching, not lynching. Lunching is not against the law. So law violation can grow out of group conflict, and that may be a nonviolent disruption or noncompliance, may lead to noncompliance with police orders. So anti-abortion activists have damaged property and broken laws, pro-choice has assaulted protesters. Both sides believe they are adamantly right. If such a protest reached the point of questioning the entire system, revolts could occur. These crimes are political crimes. They're law violations motivated by the desire to influence existing public policy. Uh, they may be committed by people who oppose the system um, or those within the system to defend the status quo. Um, and so who gets labeled a criminal here really depends on who prevails. Um, if you think about the American Revolution, what would have happened if um, the colonists had not won? Well, if the colonists had not been victorious, they would have been traitors would have been tried and executed or tried and incarcerated. Um, so the only reason we don't refer to them as traitors is because they were successful. So what's the empirical validity here in terms of conflict theory, in terms of describing criminal behavior? Um, research that tests this directly is pretty rare. Um, so there's a dearth of studies here. Uh, that means that the, that doesn't mean that we cannot prove the theory to hold true means that we don't have adequate testing. 
Conflict theory often portrays society as so heterogeneous and so diverse that there's little consensus, and that's not really an, an accurate image um, as what well either. So what are policy implications here? Uh, with all theories, we want to think about if we're describing, if we're saying uh, reason X you know, causes crime, well, what does that mean for crime control theory, uh, crime control and crime policy? This theory implies that support for fair representation of differing interests and values um, in the law and a policy of non-discrimination with regard to race, gender, and class in the criminal justice system. That should say CJS, not CHS. Um, this, however, is already our official policy. Uh, so not much in this theory tells us how to actually make sure in practice our system does that. We know that our criminal justice system is overwhelmed. Um, and so how will we change that? All right, guys, that sort of wraps it up for us today. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know.